Dr. Ed Latessa is professor and director of the School of Criminal Justice at the University of Cincinnati and someone well known to many of us in this field. He's published over 110 works in the area of criminal justice, corrections and juvenile justice, co-author of seven books, and directed over 100 research funded, uh, funded research projects including studies ranging from day reporting centers to juvenile justice programs, drug courts, intensive supervision, halfway houses, drug programs, and others. And he and his staff have also assisted uh, over 550 correctional programs, uh, assessing them and making determinations. Uh, president of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, uh, for the years 1989 and 90, and the recipient of many awards, uh, too numerous to mention in the time allotted to me here. Suffice it to say that uh, this is an individual with an awful lot of credibility, and we're fortunate to have the benefit of his insights and research today. Professor Ed Latessa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me say it's nice to be here among so many uh, friends and, and people that I've worked with over the years. Uh, when, when Mike Thompson asked me to speak, we, we had a conference call in, in which he went through and told me everything I was supposed to say, uh, and, and I forgot most of what he said. So um, I, I'm and I, I have a fairly short time to, to get through this and, and, and really going to reinforce, I hope, some of the things that, that you heard here this morning um, uh, around you know, effective programs and what goes into them. Uh, let me say right from the beginning, I, I, never, I never started out with the idea of changing policy or affecting policy. I, I don't pretend to know much about that. The, the good folks at Pew and, and council state governments and others uh, really um, specialize in that. And they've done some incredible work around the country. And some of my work has, has influenced them. But uh, at the end of the day, I'm really just a guy that, that can go in and help a program become more effective. Uh, that's what I always started out to do. I'm really an evaluator at heart. Uh, along the way, I started asking myself, you know, what is it about the programs that seem to work that's different than the programs that don't work? And I, over the years, I've, I've learned quite a few things about uh, what it takes to build effective programs. One of the things it takes is leadership. I, I've never seen an effective program or institution or probation department without strong leadership. And so I, I think that's certainly the role that most of you play. Uh, that's critical. Uh, without that leadership, uh, the chances that you'll build effective programs to reduce recidivism uh, go way, way down. Uh, the other thing let me say is I've, I've done hundreds of studies of correctional programs. And I'm pretty clear about what it is. When someone wants to know if a correctional program works, they usually want to know is it reducing recidivism. Is it changing people's behavior? They're less likely to continue to use drugs and deal drugs and hurt people and steal and do all the things that got them into trouble. Okay? Nobody cares if defenders like the program or not, whether the staff like the program or not. Okay? It's really about that bottom line, recidivism. And we can talk about all the other indicators and all the things that are important, but well, you know, the public wants to know. You know, if we put somebody in a, in a correctional setting, are they coming out better than they went in? That's really what it's all about. So I've entitled this, What Works and What Doesn't in Reducing Recidivism, Some Lessons Learned from Evaluating Correctional Programs. And, and I know many of you have heard me before, and, 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 but I just want you to know my friends from Ohio have heard me like 50 times, all right? So, so um, you're going to just have to bear with me, see if I can get this thing to work. Mm -hmm. First lesson that I've learned over the years is some things don't work. Okay. Like this clicker. <clears throat> over the years, my staff and I have assessed hundreds, now probably up near around 600 or 700 correctional programs. These are some of the theories that we've come across over the years. One is offenders lack creativity theory. I remember if I assessed a drug program once out in California for parolees, and, and they spent all day in this halfway house doing art therapy. 
Okay, pictures and drawings. And I remember saying to the program director, why do you spend all your time on art therapy? And she said, well, it reduces stress. I said, you're right. You must have the most relaxed drug addicts in the state of California. Okay. By the way, as most of you know, prisons are filled with good artists. Okay. Offenders lack, need discipline and physical conditioning theory, right? We need, to, we need to just get them in shape, right? And of course, we see that in, in boot, boot camps and other programs. I never really understood that theory. Eh? I don't want offenders in good shape, to tell you the <laughs> truth. I, I remember once I, I interviewed a young man at a boot camp, and I asked him, what have you gotten out of the program? And he looked at me, and he said, I'm in the best physical condition of my life, sir. And I thought, now he can run me down and kick my ass even quicker. Eh? <clears throat> diet, the, change their diet. That was a California one. Uh, 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 treat them like babies and put them in diapers. That was a, a therapeutic community I assessed once at a prison. And that's what the program director would do. She would, if they acted up, she'd make them come in a diaper to, to group. It's a shaming technique. Here's the problem. How many of you like to be shamed and humiliated? Anybody? So what do you think you get when you shame and humiliate antisocial people? Okay. <laughs> I want them to be happy theory. I, I'm sad to say that was an Ohio uh, a mental health program. We didn't know what they were doing. They just said, we want them to be happy. So we have happy offenders there. And then my favorite has always been the offenders need to get in touch with their feminine side theory. That goes something like this. The reason us men are aggressive brutes is we're just not in touch with our feminine side. That was a halfway house, and they had them dress up as women and come to group in drag. Right? <clears throat> Here's some other ones, and just a quick example. Here's a program, and I'll read you what it said. Uh, a dance program gets juveniles moving in the right track. And here's what it says. Uh, there, in a small, secure, concrete area, young male offenders dance their way toward a new outlook on life. Now, the good news is they're dancing to rappers like Tupac, 50 Cent, and R. Kelly. So they've got role models cooking. Uh, here's one. Running teaches inmates the value of success. I thought we didn't want them to run. <laughs> My favorite dance, uh, drum circles. And Here's what they had to say. They were trying to sell this to the Georgia Department of Corrections a number of years ago. And here's what she said. She introduced the first drum circle in a New Zealand prison. She describes it as, wow. That's the data they have right there, wow. Uh, it, it also doubles as a smoke sensation. Gardening conquers all how to cut your jail recidivism rates in half, 50%, mind you. I did get a call once from some county that wanted to do uh, gardening for offenders. I, they asked me what I thought they'd get. I said, vegetables is what you'll get. <laughs> and here's one, um, I like this one. Dog sledding is restorative justice. And I like what they said here. Exercising wilderness skills was seen as a way of rebuilding the perpetrator's self-esteem. So they're worried about the perpetrator. I think this actually could come in handy because when they escape from prison someday, they'll be able to make it for a while uh, with those wilderness skills. Some other things that don't work. Uh, programs that cannot maintain fidelity. I don't care what program model you're using. Uh, for example, a recent study in Ohio, we recently found that doing groups poorly was worse than not doing them at all. It was a negative effect if you did them poorly. Uh, drug prevention, shaming offenders, drug education. I can't tell you how many prisons I've been to that, that do drug education with offenders. They take drug offenders and they do, they, they do this education. It's really a dumb idea when you think about it. Okay? It's cheap, so you know, the inmates can run the groups, but there's no evidence that that has any effect on their behavior. Uh, Non-directive, talking cure, self-help programs. One of, one of the things I'll really suggest here is what we call vague, unstructured rehab programs. Most of you run prison systems and you have detailed policy. You, you have policy about everything. How many times you count them and when they go eat and everything. Yet you create programs and you just hire some folks and say, go on and do a program. Okay? You don't have detailed program descriptions about what's going to be targeted, how it's going to be targeted, how it's going to be monitored for change. Okay? And the result is we get these vague, unstructured programs. And when, you, and when those people quit and move on and you hire new people, they're running in the program the only way they want to run it. So we've really got to do a better job there of, of structuring our programs. Uh, 
clicker here. Second lesson is almost anything you want to fix starts with assessment. Right? And I don't just mean the fenders. Your car. Right? You take it to the mechanic. You want them to hook it up to the computer and, 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 and get a printout. Right? You want them to ask you some questions. You go to the doctor. You have a heart condition. I, I don't care. You go to the doctor for anything. What do they do? They start with your temperature, your blood pressure. Then if maybe you're really, really ill, they may schedule some tests. They're doing an assessment. So almost anything we do starts with good assessment. Now, there's nothing new about assessment. Right? We've been doing assessment since 1928. Actuarial assessment was developed in the state of Illinois by the Illinois Parole Board in 1928. So there's nothing new about it. It's how we use it. We need it to meet the risk and need principle. It helps reduce bias. It helps us know if interventions have worked because we can reassess people. And it avoid, helps us avoid watermelon thumping. Did I spell that right? I don't know. Anyway, what's watermelon thumping? When I was a kid, I grew up, I grew up in uh, uh, Northeast Ohio, and my mother would send my dad and I down to the market to get a watermelon. My dad would thump on every watermelon there. And I remember saying to him, Dad, what are you doing? And he'd tell me, I'm, I'm getting a ripe watermelon. My dad always picked out a ripe, juicy watermelon. He had the touch. I go to the store, I take my four kids, my wife says, get a, get, get a watermelon. I thump on every watermelon in the bin. My kids will look at me, they'll say, Dad, what are you doing? And I tell them, I'm picking out a good watermelon. And they nod their heads. I don't have a clue. <laughs> Half the time I get a bad watermelon. <laughs> watermelon thumping is not a good way to make decisions about risk and needs. And not just you, most of you are doing it, but we've got to back it up. We've got to do it at the court level. We've got to do it at probation. We've really got to do a good job of assessing offenders if we want to know who to target and what to target. Uh, this is a new assessment we, we developed in Ohio, and I, I just want to show it to you real quick. We took a little bit of a different approach. We assessed offenders at each level, and we came up with four different tools. A pretrial tool, a community supervision tool, and a prison intake tool, and a reentry tool. And when I did it, you know, I wasn't excited about most of those other ones because I knew we'd find what everyone else found. But I was really interested in this reentry tool because I, I've always argue that, you know, you bring somebody into prison and you assess them, and that's fine, and that's not that hard to do, you know what they look like, they're coming off the streets. But someone's been in prison five years, how do you, re what do you reassess them on? Where they've been living? Eh? Who they're hanging around with? Eh? All of a sudden, a lot of those factors start to change. And lo and behold, that's what we found. When we looked at reentry, when we looked at men and women coming out of prison who had been in prison for several years, there were only three domains that showed up. Criminal history, social support systems, and criminal attitudes and behavioral patterns. Everything else disappeared. Okay? Because it's a much different animal when someone's been in prison four years, five years, 10 years, than what they looked like when they came in. <clears throat> this is what it looks like. We, we created a, a, a speedometer so it's easy to understand. And then we have all the domains, and then as you reassess offenders, you can see how they change over time. And uh, we're starting to, uh, other states are starting to look at this tool and, and to use it. And so we're, we're very, very happy about uh, the fact that uh, it's getting some traction out there. Lesson number three, if you want to reduce recidivism, you need to focus on the people likely to recidivate. That's really the risk principle. You've heard data now. It's simple. If half the people that come out of prison never go back again, which half are we worried about? Well, the half that will. You're not going to reduce recidivism, by the way, by focusing on low-risk offenders because they're not reoffending. Okay? This is what it looks like. In our Ohio data, this is what risk looks like. Okay? We've got low risk, moderate risk, high risk, and very high risk. The high risk and not very high risk are the folks that we're worried about. They're the ones we need to focus on, not the low-risk offenders. They don't need us. Okay? They broke the law, they committed a crime, they go to prison, but most of them come out and they've got some resources, they've got some support, they don't have those criminal attitudes entrenched. Okay? Let's not waste our time and money on them. Mm -hmm. Lesson four, sometimes we fail because we provide programs to the wrong people. Again, one of the risk principles 
attributes is that if you focus on low-risk people, you can oftentimes make them worse. In 2002, Reggie Wilkinson was the director of corrections in Ohio. And uh, he asked us to do a study to look at our community-based correctional programs. Uh, Ohio was blessed that we had spent, we were spending a lot of money on community-based correctional facilities and halfway houses, uh, but every year they came forward and wanted more money. And Reggie had a simple question that he wanted me to answer. Were they effective in reducing recidivism? That's just a simple question. Uh, so we did a study, it was a large study, 13,000 offenders, and this is what we found, hopefully we'll get there, this is what we found when we looked at low-risk offenders that were placed in those programs. The red bars are increases in recidivism. So the vast majority of these very expensive programs were increasing recidivism rates. And as I said to Reggie at the time, why would you spend $65 a day to increase failure? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the treatment effect for high risk. Now you see just the opposite effect. Most of the programs, the same programs, by the way, we're reducing recidivism for high-risk offenders, but yet we're failing with low-risk offenders. We did have some programs that didn't work with anyone. Okay? There was no effect with any, any risk level. The scientific term for that is <laughs> program. <all right? laughs> In 2010, we replicated the study. Bigger study, 20,000 offenders. 44 halfway houses, 20 CBCFs, and guess what we found? Same effects, low risk, minimal effects, high risk, strong effects. And by the way, we had invested in improving some of these programs. If you look down here at the end of this, at the end of this bar here, you'll see that we had programs that were reducing recidivism 50% or higher for high risk offenders. And of course, the goal is to get all the programs into, that, into those groups. Okay? But when people say, well, we can't change the, the behavior of high-risk offenders, it's simply not true. We have a lot of data that says we can't. Number five, sometimes we fail because we do not provide enough treatment. Okay. I got thinking about this um, a couple of years ago. I went through, a, through an illness, and I got thinking about this whole issue of dosage of treatment. You know, we always talked about intent, give them more treatment, make it intense, and, and, but he never translated that very well. What does intensive treatment mean? And, and as I went through my treatment, you know, I thought about how the doctors were very careful in, their, in the dosage of treatment. I had to get radiation, right? Well, what happens if you get too much radiation? They kill you. And what happens if they don't give you enough? Doesn't kill the tumor. Right? And, and the same with chemo. And, 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 and so I started thinking about this issue, and then there were some studies, and of course, we had some data that says, right, that, uh, that, that the longer people were in treatment, the stronger the effect. And a lot of data, substance abuse studies and others, right? But it also said if you keep them in treatment too long, effects start to go down. And, and I think that's because people give up, to be quite honest. If I keep you in something way too long, you, you kind of give up. And, and so we would go out and we would tell people, you know, you have to have this kind of range of time for treatment. But I also knew from looking at lots of correctional programs, even, even programs like therapeutic communities and residential programs, when you started stripping them down, they weren't doing as much treatment as they really said. Okay. They might do a couple hours a week of evidence-based practice. And, and so we did a little study here in Ohio recently, and we looked, at, um, we looked at, a, at a facility that happened to have data on how many hours the, the men spent in evidence-based programs. Okay. And, and this is what we found. Okay. This is not important. This is what we found here in terms of the uh, uh, treatment effect. For moderate risk offenders, increasing the dosage of treatment didn't make that much difference. But for high risk offenders, increasing the dosage of treatment made a dramatic difference in reducing recidivism. I'm telling you this because what it means is we can't have one size fits all program. 
And that's the reality of what most of your programs, they go for their for six weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks, everybody gets the same thing. Okay? And the problem is, a lot of the people you deal with are high risk. And so it's not that you don't have good programs in some cases, but you're not giving them enough treatment. Okay? These are our rules of thumb, 100 hours for moderate risk, 200 hours for higher risk. But look at this finding, 100 hours for high risk will have little, if any, effect. So we need to start doing a better job of looking at the dosage of treatment. Lesson number six, everybody thinks they're an expert in criminal behavior. And I don't mean you, you are experts, but, uh, but think about it. I'll bet you people tell you how to do your jobs. I'll bet your family and others tell you what you should be doing. All right? You get that, I get it all the time. Uh, um, I think there's two ways, we, reasons we go wrong here. One is sometimes training takes us in a very narrow, uh, narrow path. For example, if you're trained in substance abuse, what are they looking for? Substance abuse. If you're trained in mental health, what are you looking for? Mental health. And that's a very narrow perspective of risk and criminal, criminogenic needs. Okay. And, and again, everybody thinks they know why people are criminal. I was on a flight once, I was flying to Boise. And uh, I, I was seated next to this elderly woman, you know, one of these chatty types who wouldn't take a hint. And uh, <laughs> she asked me what I did for a living, and I made the mistake of telling her. And for four hours, she told me how to solve the crime problem. Didn't get off in Salt Lake, stayed right on with me. <laughs> <clears throat> now I just tell them I'm a proctologist, they leave me alone. <laughs> these are the major set starting with antisocial, pro-criminal attitudes, values, and beliefs, the way offenders think and see the world, blame others, don't accept responsibility, short-term thinking. I interviewed a parolee the other day. I said, are you working? He said, no, I quit my job. I said, why? He said, I wasn't getting enough hours. <laughs> I said, how many are you getting now? He said, none. I said, you're moving backwards. Most people don't quit their job till they have another one lined up. Not him, he showed them. He went from 20 to zero. It's that kind of thinking, not thinking through the consequences. That short-term impulsivity that also often gives them into trouble. They hang around with the wrong people. We know that, our mothers knew that. If you're a parent, you knew it. You worried about who your kids hung around with. But it's not just having bad people around you. It's not having pro-social people. We have to do a better job, not just of restricting where they go and who they hang around with, because the minute you go away, they go back. You've got to hook them up with pro-social people. That has to be part of your reentry strategy. Okay. You have to identify those folks. If they don't have them, you've got to create them. Okay. Family factors, education and achievement. That's the key word. It's not about getting them a job. It's about how they view work. And of course, substance abuse. But let me be clear. We believe these four run through these four. These are the core. This is what you should be focusing on, especially when they're incarcerated. Not on substance abuse. You can, you can do all you want, but they're in prison. Okay. You really got to change their attitudes about it. You got to get them to think differently about who they hang around with. You got to make them less adventurous. And you have to do that, what? By giving them new skills to handle risky situations when they get out. This study I want to show you very quickly, I'll go through it quickly, was recently done in Pennsylvania uh, by, by uh, uh, their, their Department of Corrections. And it really, to me, it really illustrates the challenges of reentry and where we fail oftentimes. Okay? And, and look at what they found in terms of, of looking at, at, at parolees who failed and those that made it. Okay? Offenders that failed were more likely to hang around with criminal, offenders with a criminal background, less likely to live with a spouse, less likely to be in a stable supportive relationship, less likely to identify someone in their life who served in a mentoring capacity. That's social support. They were less likely to have job stability, less likely to be satisfied with employment, less likely to take low-end jobs and work their way up, 
more likely to have negative attitudes toward employment, less likely to have a bank account. Yet the group that, yet they claim they were barely making it, yet the group that succeeded had twice the median debt. It wasn't about getting a job. It's about working a job. It's about, about going in and showing a boss you could do it so you can move up, so you could support your family. In terms of substance abuse, more likely to report use of alcohol or drugs on parole, but no difference in prior assessment of dependency. What was different? The failures didn't have the coping skills. When they got out and got into situations, they went right back to what they always did. We can teach that. We can work on that. We can practice that. Okay. Of course, they had the attitudes. Didn't anticipate consequences. Acted impulsively. Maintained antisocial attitudes. Viewed violations as an acceptable option. What else could I do, they said. And of course, lack of empathy and shifted blame. Interestingly, Successes and failures did not differ in finding a place to live or in eventually finding a job. I tell you that because a lot of reentry efforts I look at, that's what they focus on. Okay? And that's, that's okay. People need a job and people need a place to live. Those are, those are pretty basic human needs. But it's not going to reduce recidivism very much. If you want to reduce recidivism, you've got to pay attention to those major risk factors that are driving their behavior. Okay? Lesson seven, offenders aren't usually higher risk because they have a risk factor. They're higher risk because they have multiple risk factors. Okay. That's essentially telling us, and that's what the data tells us. The more risk factors you target, the greater the reductions in recidivism. That means we can't design silo kind of programs. Okay. And I'll give you a quick, we'll take a quick example. Employment, there, there's a good one, right? For most offenders, being unemployed is a risk factor. We'd all agree to that. Is it a risk factor for you? Would you start selling drugs, mugging old ladies, stealing cars if you lost your job? And by the looks of the data, most of you are pretty soon anyway, right? <laughs> but, but would you? No. What would you do? You'd go get another job. That's what most of us would do. Being unemployed isn't that big of a risk factor for most people. Ah, but if you said things like, I can make more money in a day than you make in a month, I don't, I'm not into that nine to five thing. I'm not working for nine bucks an hour. Now being unemployed is a big risk factor because you got those antisocial attributes and you got 40 hours a week to get into trouble. Okay? But by itself, it doesn't dramatically increase our risk. Okay. Here's a study recently done out of Rutgers looking at mentally ill offenders. By the way, mental illness is not a strong predictor of criminal behavior. Okay. It's not. Some types are, but for the overall it's not. This is basically what they found when they went into prison and assessed diagnosed mentally ill offenders with non-mentally ill offenders. The mentally ill offenders scored higher in the criminal thinking and attitudes than the non-mentally ill offenders. What did they conclude? That criminal thinking styles differentiate people who commit crimes from those who do not, independent of mental illness. Many incarcerated persons with mental illness are both mentally ill and criminal, and it needs to be treating as a co-occurring. And we could substitute substance abuse for that, and I could say the same thing. Okay. Many substance abusers started their antisocial behavior before their substance. It's part of their lifestyle. Yet we treat it like that's it, when in fact it's, we know that it's not. All right, lesson eight, doing things well makes a difference. You've heard that, and it's certainly true. We've seen it in the data. Um, I've done a couple of large studies now that looked at what we call program integrity. And program integrity is simply things like the quality of the staff, the training of the staff, the model that you use, how well you assess offenders. You know, programs that, that are high quality have the strongest effect on recidivism. In residential programs, poorly designed, poorly implemented programs increase recidivism 19%. High-quality programs reduced recidivism 
And by the way, if you put that together, what would it look like? Zero is what it would look like. Okay? Your, your, your poor programs are weighing down your effective programs. Mm -hmm. Community supervision programs, things like intensive probation and day reporting, all the things we do in the community. Guess what? Poor quality, we increase recidivism. High quality, we can reduce it. That's a 30-point swing there from the worst to the best. Mm -hmm. uh, my last lesson is that, that we can change behavior. We just have to go about it the right way. And by the way, it's not an easy thing to do. If you think it's easy to change behavior, try changing your own. Okay. It's not easy to give up a bad habit or to you know, quit smoking or lose weight. I and mean, we all know that. It's hard. And so it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and here we're dealing with people that don't want to change, many of them. Okay. So the most effective way to change behavior from all the research is to use behavioral approaches. If you stop and think about it for a minute, if I want to help you change your behavior, what are some of the ways I can do it? I can educate you about it teach you that it's bad to do these things, right? I can try to scare you out of it, right? They're already in prison. I'm not sure how far you're going to get with that, right? But, but we can try that, right? If you don't do this, all these bad things will happen. We can try to talk you out of it, or we can show you how, okay? We can practice it. We can coach you. We can give you the opportunity to try it. And that's really what behavioral programming is all about. I don't care whether you're targeting work or drugs or, or criminal attitudes, you, have, you should be using a behavioral approach. I go to a lot of facilities and they'll say to me, we're cognitive behavioral. On Monday, they do drug education. On Tuesday, they do citizen groups. On Wednesday, they do life skills. I don't know what the hell that is. Eh? On Thursday, they do thinking for a change. And on Friday, they sing Kumbaya. And they'll say to me, we're a COG program. And I'll go, no, you're an eclectic program that has a COG group on Thursday night. Okay? <laughs> You've got to design your programs around the research and around models. Structured social learning. That's the how. Practice, reinforce, extinguish inappropriate behavior. Cognitive behavioral, that's the what. The thinking. How they think, what they think. Okay? And by the way, social learning is not a theory of criminal behavior. It's a theory of human behavior. It's how most of us acquire our attitudes and our values and our beliefs from people around us. And it's reinforced. I always like to say, it's a complicated process. It's not a complicated concept. It's an easy concept to understand. How many of you have children? How many of you turned into your parents when you had children? <laughs> you woke up one day, you're your mother. That's the last person you're going to be at 15. I have four. My youngest said when she's a parent, she's going to let her kids do whatever they want. I said, you go right ahead, Al. you just be home at 10 o'clock. <laughs> but I turned into my father. I say things I swore I'd never say. You're born in a barn. You think money grows on trees. I'll give you something to cry about. That was always my thing. I said to my son one day, I said, Michael, do I look like Rockefeller? He said, who the hell is this Rockefeller guy? Do I look like Bill Gates? The fact, behavioral programs focus on current risk factors, not the past. There are a lot of programs. They want to do therapy. They want to talk about you know, all the things they did before. Can't change the past. We want to deal with current risk factors. And, and most important, they're action-oriented. If you go into a program and, and somebody's doing all the talking, that's talk therapy. You want offenders actively engaged. They have to be practicing, getting reinforced. If they're doing it wrong, get another, get, go at it another way. That's a skill-building approach. I interview inmates all the time coming out of prison. You know, they all say the same thing. I'm not coming back here. I've learned my lesson. And I'll say to them, well, what are you going to do when you get into this situation? And they'll look at me and they'll say, well, that's not going to happen. My friends aren't going to come over. Why not? Well, they know I'm going straight. I'm like, how do they know that? Is it on the internet or something? You Facebooking them? And they go, well, that's just not going to happen. It tells me immediately they've not learned skills. They don't have a risk plan. They've not practiced it. Okay. So they come out of prison with the idea, this is a bad place. I don't want to come back. Okay. 
but they don't know what to do. When they get into those risky situations, they do what they always did. And so we've got to do a better job of that on both ends. Why? Because, again, behavioral interventions produce the strongest effects. That's what we see in the research. Mm -hmm. When we put them all together, we really have the principles of risk, need, treatment, and fidelity. Who do we target? What do we target? How do we do it? And how well we do it? Four simple things that can make a big difference in public safety. So with that, I'll, I'll end. Thank you, and uh, have a great conference.